of Homeowners for Justice. Uh, we're going to back to trying our live stream. They have a new um, software. So here's hoping that it works today and doesn't blow up. <laughs> we're going to give it another shot. So today, I'm bringing you some a little bit different education today. We're obviously going to be talking about uh, issues in the news, like about loans, HARP, loan mods, um, you know, lawsuits against banks for trying to stop foreclosures, but really we need to focus on on who we're who we're struggling against. I, I don't want to use the word fighting, but the fact is we're struggling really hard. We're putting a lot of effort and time and energy into trying, we think, to get people to listen to us. I think we need to understand what's really happening. And we need to know the enemy better. I hate to call them enemies because they are our elected officials many times. But, and they may not necessarily mean to be an enemy, but we need to look at their behavior and make judgments based on behavior and what is happening. So that's why, and I've got a, a half an hour um, audio file. I'm going to link, show you the link for and put in the record, but I'm not going to listen. To, uh, have you listen to it today. You can listen to that. I highly recommend that you do, but we are going to talk about, I'm going to summarize for you the points, uh, the, the traits, the patterns, how we defend against psychopaths. And we need to understand that many, many, many people in positions of power have these, some of these traits. And so where are their weaknesses and how can we leverage those weaknesses? That's what I think we need to pay attention to today so that we can get better use out of our effort and, and hopefully get better results from our, <laughs> from our work. So, there's some, so when we shift how we view who is stopping the justice, then maybe we can consider better alternatives for getting justice. That's sort of the point I'm trying to get at. So today, we're, let's first talk about the loan mods and HARP and some things going on in foreclosures. And then I want to focus on really what is going on. I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on Eric Holder. He's the um, Attorney General in the Department of Justice. A, a key kingpin. Many, many things, including bank lawsuits, rest on him and so it's not what he's done but it's what he hasn't done that we need to really focus on and then why and then how can we change that so just for the quick update harp has been extended by fha fhfa through 2015 and so here's an article that talks about that that's um loan mods uh through fannie freddie the home affordable refinance program uh, for borrowers of Fannie and Freddie loans. So if you've got a Fannie or Freddie loan, HARP has been extended. Doesn't mean you're going to get one, but it means that you can still keep trying and they'll keep trying to give you a loan mod through 2015. So just that's for your um, information and for your family, friends, neighbors. Please pass these on. Freddie Mac, interestingly enough, yesterday announced the immediate availability of streamlined modification for delinquent borrowers and of course then you know you delve into the little details and you go okay it's now immediately available and extend to the entire country this is freddie mac's decision for the streamlined modification and under this modification servicers are required to send modification offers to borrowers who are at least 90 days, but no more than 720 days delinquent. So I guess if you're 721 days delinquent, no luck for you. It, some of these rules just make me shake my head in wonder. Who, who dreams this stuff up? And I want you to understand that as a broker in this industry, 
I see these banks and federal government agencies, you know, the quasi-government, Fannie Freddie, making up rules as they go. They make them up out of thin air, and then, of course, they'll throw you in prison if you violate that rule. So it's, it's truly, in my words or opinion, a, a form of extortion because they make the rules up. People try to, you know, fit into the rules. If you can't fit in, you're lost. Uh, it, it's truly just another indication to me of the Gestapo mentality. So, uh, so that you can take a look for that, go ahead and um, ha share that link with others. Then here's another quick little article about Fannie and Freddie, how they're zombies, and basically how the hedge funds want to buy them and want to make them go private, and yet the government wants to keep them and milk them for the income. So it's no surprise they'll probably stay as Fannie Freddie government-controlled entities as long as they can give them the government some money. Welcome to the federal government. Now, quick update on the Colorado foreclosure. The banks walk away from foreclosure on the Aurora woman. This is the person in Colorado. And this is where the U.S. federal judge said, wait a minute, I don't think Colorado's uh, foreclosure laws are legal. I don't think it's fair. And so let's review this. And now, of course, on this, and of course, attorneys float out of the woodwork to try to help her and you know, defend her now even for free. And of course, the bank has just said, whoop, we're done. We're rescinding the whole thing. And you, and, and pay attention to this. Pay attention to this because this is one of the keys in psychopaths. They don't want to be discovered. They don't want to be exposed. That is the key thing. And I'm going to explain it again and say it again because that's one of the key powers that we have as a person, as a people, as a country. We can expose them for what they are. They'll run away. And this is what the bank did. You don't think the bank wants to try to fight for foreclosure if they're going to be more exposed that they have to do go through discovery or you know prove they have standing or the right to foreclose and so the bank just says whoa we're done we're out of here interesting isn't it fascinating and then of course here in Colorado is a second federal suit challenging the Colorado foreclosure law so now they've got a lawsuit contesting the constitutionality of Colorado's foreclosure laws and unlike the case of this Aurora woman who obtained an interim injunction and now the bank has disappeared, the federal judge who decided a Denver man's 14th Amendment guarantee of due process was in question. So now you've got federal judges actually looking at these complaints with, in my words, a little broader perspective than just perhaps the pleadings. And so this judge dismissed the entirety of his complaint against B of A that challenged the bank's right to foreclose on the condo. He, the judge determined that there was a constitutional issue, even though the borrower didn't bring it up specifically. Okay, to me, to you, that sounds like winds of change. Let's keep pushing them. Now, I want to talk and focus on government tyranny. I believe all of the foreclosure crisis, all of the fraudulent documents, all of this, the toxic loans, was is really just a symptom of what we're seeing is tyranny. And and so I'm, I'm going way back. Here's a quick little article, and I'm going to read just a little section of it. We need to understand that the founders of this country that came over from England, they, they risked their lives and floated across an unknown ocean to get away from tyranny. So with that in mind, that's where our forefathers came from. So this talks about an article that Jefferson drafted. This is back in between uh, 1798, between in July to October in 1798. And 
it, uh, Kentucky was the perfect forum for Jefferson's resolution. Uh, across the state without much prompting, citizens gathered to protest the Alien and Sedition Acts. And in Lexington, a whole bunch of people gathered, three times the town's population. And they were protesting the unconstitutional laws of Congress. And a committee led by John Breckinridge was appointed, and the Kentucky Resolution was quickly introduced, and it was quickly passed. And the resolves began with the Tenth Amendment, which I'm going to show you in just a minute, which Jefferson described in 1791 as the foundation of our Constitution. The Tenth Amendment is the foundation, and it came from people like you and me, the 99%, protesting against unconstitutional laws of Congress. And so here is the Tenth Amendment. This is just from Wikipedia. You'll have the link. You can look it up even now. And this is the text. The powers not delegated, given, to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people. So in other words, you and I, us in the states, give to the government, the federal government, only the power we want to give it. Anything else it takes, it, it's unconstitutional. And this is why I want to talk about the what is going on. We're taking off our rose-colored glasses and we're looking at existent life the way it really is. So. Now we're going to talk about what is going on. One of the things that is going on is mainstream media and how they are self-censoring. Here's a little article. It's just uh, published today. And they literally admit to self-censoring. In other words, what they do, uh, one of the most pernicious ways in which they self-censor is they write something out and then they shift the words. Why do we modify the free and frank expression of journalistic truth? We do it out of fear. This is from the journalist perspective. They fear for their jobs. They fear they're going to get criticized. They fear that someone will seek to hang a sign around their neck that says that they're unpatriotic. They modify what they've written with euphemisms like collateral damage, less than truthful statements. We modify with passive voice constructions such as mistakes were made rather than they lied, cheated, and stole. And you'll notice that most of my indictments and phraseology is not passive. It's active. So think about that as you read articles, as you say things, as you listen to things being said. Are they active? Are they passive? The, um, they modify with false equivalencies that provide for bad behavior, the ready-made excuse that everybody's doing it. They modify with an eraser. They simply just remove the offending and inconvenient truths from the reporting. And so you've got Keith Olbermann stating, you can rock the boat, but you can never say the entire ocean is in trouble. You can't say, by the way, this is systemic. This is everything. Now you and I are saying that, but the mainstream media is not. And it's in danger of becoming increasingly irrelevant because of that, because of the self-censorship. So here we go. The media is self-censoring, and then you've got the Department of Justice not finding facts. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. So the DOJ is saying, I can't see anything, and that is the point. So here you've got a senator talking about Chase and how a private lawsuit against Chase found facts, evidence, that the Department of Justice can't find. It's because they're not looking, and you and I know this. And so here, what Senator Kaufman is referring to is the headlines like, 
Emails implied J.P. Morgan Chase knew some mortgage deals were bad, or they hid reports of defective loans before sales. And this is the statement that Senator Kaufman makes. It is just hard to believe that if the DOJ had made Wall Street fraud a priority <clears throat> with the resources that they have, that they couldn't have found this information. <clears throat> you and I <clears throat> both know that it was intentional. And that's why we must look at Eric Holder. Lanny has stepped down after the Untouchables um, expose from 60 Minutes. But this is the point. Why are they not finding this? Because they are intentionally not looking. So here's what now they've done today. This is what's happened right now. So take all of these issues. What we were just talking about right there is they can't find bank fraud, but they can find this. Notice what the DOJ is doing. This whole transparency thing with the president is crumbling, isn't it? Because first of all, we had, well, in fact, let's just go back two weeks. The whole Guantanamo Bay issue uh, rumbles, rumbles on. A place he said he shut down, but he didn't. Then we have Benghazi, where we have apparently 12 corrections in terms of talking points. Then we have the IRS targeting tea parties and people who use the word patriot or say they want to uh, improve their country. And now we have this. We have the Justice Department targeting AP, the Associated Press. What do you make of all this? How transparent is this? Because it seems to me to be pretty non-transparent. Look, I don't think the one we learned about today is so much a matter of transparency as a violation or at least a danger uh, to the First Amendment, to the notion of civil liberties and the like. Some of the others, though, obviously do raise serious questions of uh, candor uh, with the American public. There, there's just no denying it. In terms of a specific issue of the breaking story tonight involving the Associated Press, yeah. Have they broken the law, the Justice Department, by doing this? Uh, it's possible. I doubt it, though. You know, the Department of Justice has internal regulations which, uh, which govern their behavior. And as a general proposition, before they go after phone records or confidential sources, they're supposed to negotiate, supposed to talk to the journalist or the journalist bosses. Here they didn't. Now there is an exception in this rule here if by, by even communicating to them it would interfere with the integrity of the investigation. But it sure is hard to believe that an investigation which was really pretty well known around Washington and certainly to the AP could have been so frustrated by simply giving them a chance to go to court. I mean that's the, one of the real problems here. If you don't tell them in advance if you don't tell the journalist, if you don't tell the AP, they have no recourse. They can't go to court and ask a judge to protect them because the secret is gone. Yeah, I, I think it's completely outrageous. I mean, never my First Amendment rights, which are obviously extremely important in this particular case, but also the whole issue of protecting sources. And let's yeah. remind everyone that, that when they were asked to hold the story, which involved this foiled terror plot, they did do that. So they behaved very responsibly. Uh, and, very, and, very. And, and they've been rewarded for this responsible yeah. journalism yeah. by being kicked in the teeth, it seems to me. Yeah. No, look, that's, I, I think that's absolutely right. Now, from Justice's point of view, they don't care about that. They want to get their guy. They want to get the person who did the leaking. But in the course of that, look what they're doing. What, 20 different telephones over two months from the Associated Press? All those calls recorded that is to say, who spoke to whom via telephone number, all that is now in the hands of the Department of Justice. I mean, that's, that's not America at its best. All right. So there you have it. We have the Department of Justice capturing, my words, unconstitutionally and illegally, all of this information they're doing this to one of the key news agencies in this country and they can't find any bank fraud. So let me tell you something. This is not an accident. We got to stop being outraged at their 
stupidity because it is not stupid. This is intentional. We have to understand this is the plan. If, we, if you don't recognize that this is the plan, then you need to stop and think about it. And you need to read these articles and you need to review all of the information and all of those links that I've been sharing with you over the last several months. The fact is, they're not stupid. They know what they are doing and this is the plan. And that's why we're talking about psychopaths today. Because really, for you and me, this plan to, to really take effect has to be, a person has to be psychopathic. And you'll see why, why I say that. And that is why we're talking about it. So now they're going to take all this information secretly from our news agency to basically chill reporters and reporting and to maybe go after those people. We don't know what they're going to do with that information, although now we have some ideas and it's not good. Here's the next article. Fed shrugs off law requiring email warrants. Despite an appeals court ruling that government snooping on emails requires a search warrant, the FBI and other federal law enforcer, enforcers, so think DHS, FEMA, think any agency, any federal agency. The Federal Reserve, they all have police forces, remember? And so they regularly ignore the constitutional mandate. So what are we going to do about it when they ignore this constitutional mandate? Who's going to put them back in line? And that is something we really need to start thinking about. It all starts at the top. It, it really is a, a climate of corruption and government overreach, starting with Eric Holder. And that's why I want you to understand who we're dealing with and, and how he thinks and what he's going to say and do. So this, this is just an article, this was written two years ago, um, well, a year and a half, December uh, 2011, and it's about his ethics, and it's about his testifying uh, before the Senate Judiciary Committee about Fast and Furious. And all you need to read is this first paragraph. His answers at times seemed incredible and stretched the limits of believability. What that means is, he lied. Everybody knew it. They just can't prove it, so they can't call him a liar. But that is the answer. He's lying. And then the article goes on, talks about a series of memos uncovered by CBS News showing that in 2010, he received at least, Eric, received at least five different notices concerning Fast and Furious from another guy, Michael Walther, the director of the National Drug Intelligence Center, and also a memo from Lanny Brewer. So he gets up in front of the committee and lies. And he's getting away with it. And that is the scary part. Right now, these liars are winning because they lie. And nobody is holding them to the fact that they are lying. And, and this is the problem. Because when liars win, truth loses. And you and I, the 99%, we're on the side of truth. We're, we're losing. And of course, I've pointed out repeatedly, and if you don't know, here you go. He worked for Covington and Burling. Oh, let me just zip back to him. Um, let's see. Uh, talks about where he works for Covington and Burling. Um, I knew, of course, for a long time that he worked there. And Covington and Burling is a key bank attorney. They are an international law firm, and this article here, this Wikipedia, doesn't really talk about, you know, them working uh, for banks, but they were the major attorneys for major banks right, right in Washington, D.C., and Eric worked for them. So this is the connection. This is the revolving door, and it's Covington and Burling that did the MERS legal opinion. And here it is for you. So if you want to read the MERS legal opinion written by Covington and Burling back in 2004, here you go. And that's, he worked there. It's, it's a closed club. And this is why Eric has made it a policy that they will not pursue bank fraud. 
that is a policy. I want to, here's my homeowners for justice page. If you haven't found this page or know about it, I'm just showing you so that you can. This is under uh, fraud and corruption, corrupt officials, and this is a page I put together quite some time ago. Um, I've linked a, a, a live stream here, but this page was done back in 2012, and I talk about what is happening. The fact is that because Eric Holder will not step up and charge the banks with fraud, we're all hurt. Not only, but it's not only Eric, and this, so this talks about others. And back in November 2011, Here's the article where Paulson lied to Congress about Fannie and Freddie, but told the hedge funds that the government was going to take them over with FHFA. And so the hedge funds were able to make money on this. This corruption extends everywhere. It's every administration. It, the administrations are just a distraction for you and me to try to, you know, cheer on or fight over. It's like football teams. They, it doesn't matter to the people that control. If they can distract us with that, then they win. We need to get beyond the teams that are playing and what they're playing and what they're doing and recognize that this is a bigger game plan to take over us and the country and to keep us under control, turn us into dollar signs. And, and know everything that you say, do, and every, everywhere you go. So here you can find uh, these 14 articles that I had linked at that time, why they won't prosecute the big fish, you know, because of campaign funds, why big bank fraud caused the financial crisis and the foreclosure pandemic. Duh. Here it is. And if you need to get others sort of up to speed in the history of this crime and corrupt cartel between the banks and the government, just send them the link to this page. It will be on the comment section. And so here are the names that I really focused on. Jim Johnson, CEO of Corrupt CEO of Fannie Mae, and Reckless Endangerment, that's a book by Gretchen Morkinson. That's where you discover all this stuff. She, they did a great documentary. Nobody seems to know about it. Here's another frontline um, episode done a couple of years ago. And you, I said in the third hour, a minute 15, you watch. That's where the real power is. And how basically Obama went with Geithner instead of Summers. Larry Summers said, prosecute, prosecute, make him walk the perp line. At least one banker CEO for all this fraud and corruption. And Geithner said, oh no, oh no, bail him out, bail him out. You know what we got. History shows you what we got. And so then, of course, DeMarco, Donalyn, Geithner, Holner, Holder, and Bruner, they all are in this cl small club. And this is, this is why the people won't get justice and why the fix is in and why it has been so incredibly difficult to fight against that and around it because that's where charges should have started. They should have started at the DOJ. So when they've gotten the DOJ, the rest of us are left to really, you know, we're left dangling, trying to get our state AGs to do something, try to get the county DAs to do something. It's, it's really a challenge. And here's an article, key article, about the top justice officials connected to mortgage banks. We know that this has been the way it is, and this is why we're still struggling and fighting. So these links will be for you to share with family, friends, neighbors, Facebooks. Let's get this information out again. Even though these articles were written last year, two years, three years ago, they're still extremely relevant because this is the foundation of the fraud and why we can't get a fix in. Now, quickly, I, I wanted to highlight a couple of these articles because the fact of the matter is, it is well known if you look at history without rose-colored glasses and stop thinking about the U.S. is impervious to this and start recognizing that we are frogs in a pot and we are right in the middle of it and we need to see it clearly, then you can understand this article, which just parallels the U.S. Patriot Act and the Nazi Enabling Act. Considering the following two statements and see if you can identify the authors. The first statement, quote, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That's easy. 
all you have to do, now listen up, is tell them they're being attacked and denounce the pacifists for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same way in any country. Does that sound familiar? And here's a second statement. To those who scare peace-loving people with phantoms of lost liberty, my message is this. Your tactics only aid terrorists, for they erode our national unity and diminish our resolve. The first one, the first quote was actually from Hitler's right-hand man. The second quote is from Bush's right-hand man, John Ashcroft, defending the Patriot Act and explaining why dissent will no longer be tolerated in the age of terrorism. Now that is really, really scary. And this, so let's learn this, and here's how we fight back. We have to start paying attention on, on what, what we're facing, S stop denying it, then we can look at it and we can be more rational and thoughtful in our approaches. This is an interesting little title, the preface to Medical Veritas, it, it doesn't really match what I really wanted to point out. And here are these three links right here are audio. Um, you can listen to them and they're good. But this is the misguided notion that we need to be governed because we're too simple-minded. That is nothing but propaganda professing us to think that we don't know how to spend our own money wisely, that we can't take responsibility for our actions, therefore we must employ dictatorial servants to make these decisions for us. But wait, if we can't make good decisions for our own, how is it that we can make good decisions for those we elect? So you see the fallibility of that idea. If we're that stupid, that we don't know how to run our own lives, then how in the world could we elect the right leaders? Let's remember that we're not that stupid. And it's the leaders that are feeding us this propaganda. And it's the media that is shifting, self-censoring what they say. Because they want to work. They have family and, and need food too. They have bills to pay. So everyone's worried about losing their job, about being labeled a terrorist. And now, if they arrested me on the street and called me a terrorist and threw me in, in prison without any rights or due process, what could I do about it? What could you do about it? What would anybody do about it? I'd be left there forgotten. So would you. And that is the really scary part. That's why we're going to be talking about psychopaths. So on psychopaths, you need to know the traits. So if you see these traits in anyone's behavior or actions, start thinking about it. Start recognizing it for what it is. Don't say the person is stupid. They're not. They probably know that they are doing this. If you listen to the link, um, and here's the link uh, right here. There we go. This is the psychopath, the market in life. You're dealing with them every day and how to protect yourself. And it's about 31 minutes. But here are, so I'm summarizing, here are the traits. If you see someone, like you watch that, um, you watch a lot of those people that have been charged. Now it's, you know, distraction media about, oh, look at the lawsuit, look at this look at them charging her the criminal charges and the whole court action and you watch these people you watch them talk and say as you watch them you can tell if they have real empathy or not you can tell if they have any real remorse or guilt or if they're just play acting and that is the difference psychopaths evidently some of them are born that way some of the people I, w I would call it with a real deficiency. Some of them are created that way because of their environment, like in gangs, you either are tormented or you join the gang, and gangs are basically psychopathic. They can't have empathy, they can't show remorse or guilt, they're very superficial, they act very grandiose. And you can think of this in your relationships. Is there someone that you know someone that you rub shoulders with at work that exudes these traits. These are the traits. These are the key ways that you and I can recognize if someone is really more on the psychopathic side than on, 
on the real caring humanity side. So if they have impulsive behavior, do they see something that somebody else has and they want it and they just grab it? Because in a psychopath mind, that's all good. They don't have any remorse or guilt. They don't have any empathy for anybody else. And so the rules that they operate by are, if I want it, it's good. And if I take it, that's great. It has, they don't buy into, they can't. And this is what we need to understand. When they have these traits that become more and more ingrained and obvious, they can't change. This is who they are. So we need to understand that too and stop trying to rescue them. We need to not try to waste our time and efforts getting, you know, getting beat up by somebody who doesn't want to be rescued and can't be rescued. We need to defend ourselves against them. And we need to understand that this is what we're dealing with. They're very manipulative and their behavior is basically quite antisocial. So no empathy, no remorse or guilt, very superficial, acting grandiose, impulsive, manipulative, and antisocial. And people are going to be on a, 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 a line, if you will. They're going to have varying degrees in varying circumstances. But you and I, as we open our eyes and recognize that lots of people have these traits, then we can recognize what we're dealing with. Because that's one of the first defenses is to stop denying that they exist. Stop thinking that you can change them. Recognize them for what they are. That is key. And I'm telling myself as much as I'm telling you. Because generally speaking, this is their pattern. This is what they typically do. When they meet you, evidently they're very good because they've done this their whole life at doing what is called an interview or cold reading, which means as they talk to you and tell you things or say things, they, they gauge your reaction back and they categorize you. They're not connecting with you. They're trying to figure out if you'd be a good victim or not. So be aware of that. That way you can protect yourself. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So if you sense the kinds of questions and answers. That's why it's really important that you listen to that audio. If you sense that you're being gauged for being a victim, run. Just get away. Because that's one of the things that you can do is just get away. You know, don't have anything to do with that person. Cut them out of your life. Then once they've interviewed you and they've decided that you know, they know how to victimize you. Remember, they're manipulative, and so they're always looking at how can they control you? How can they get what they want out of you? And that's the often, that's what we're seeing in our government. They're looking at us basically as victims. How can they get what they want out of us? That's how banks look at uh, foreclosure people. You know, as they're taking foreclosure and taking the houses, they're victimizing the owners with loan, you know, lying loan mods. They, they say, they seduce, okay, there's the seduction. Hey, we'll give you a loan mod. And the person goes, yes, I want a loan mod. And then, of course, they victimize them by losing the paperwork, you know, dragging them on, lying to them here and there. They, they divide and conquer. They will try to chop that person up into pieces until a person can't fight back anymore. You and I know this. If they're in a company, they will try to pit the other employees against each other, develop factions, lie to this one, lie to that one, make them fight each other in the meantime, because when they do that, then they can seize control. This is how psychopaths, we, we call it maybe power hungry, there's other words that we're using, but this is a once we understand this is how they work, then we can recognize it when we see it. That's why I'm pushing this today, so that you and I and everybody that watches this live stream can start to recognize what is going on for what it is. And so then, once they've conquered, whether it's in a personal relationship, this is how you get um, abusers, uh, you, um, 
and it can be male or female, how they are abusing the partner. They've seduced them, they've read them to be a victim, now they seduce them, then they start, then they suck them in, and then they start the fear, extortion, and blackmail. They, they know everybody's secrets because that's how they manipulate them. If you can't you know, give them a carrot, if you can't buy them off, then you're going to make them, you're going to lose your job, you'll fear them. And this is what the banks and all the lobbyists are doing with all of our leaders. The, they are basically a psychopathic organization, even if the people are, are great. What they are actually doing with our leaders and our elected representatives, state level, uh, federal, even probably at some point, sometimes local, and that is they use either the, you know, carrot or the stick. They will say, here, I'll give you campaign funds. You just make sure you know who you're going to be loyal to. Or they say, well, if you can't be loyal, then the next time the election cycle runs around, then they pour money into the opposition. And so they get somebody else elected that is going to be loyal. And that's the fear, extortion, and blackmail that we see. Now, I really wanted to talk about the defense because this is really key. We need to understand that we're not powerless, okay? But basically, you can only attack them if you're a bigger psycho. So that isn't pr probably going to work because the people really don't have that kind of, a, a, of power or mentality. And, and the evade is if it's possible. That's why I said if you sense that you're being gauged to be a victim, get out. And, and the very first thing you need to do is acknowledge that they exist. And they exist everywhere. Lots of people have some of these traits. And, and we need to be aware of them so that we can protect ourselves against them. Because being forewarned is being forearmed. If we understand that this is how people can operate, then when we see these operations in, in effect, then we can understand what's going on. We can comprehend, you have to comprehend that this is their mentality, they're predators. They are predators. So when we looked at Eric Holder and we look at the things that he's been saying, you know, in the congressional hearings, we look at the behaviors. You read some of those articles. I haven't even talked about everything that's hap that he's done or has happened. When you look at that and recognize it, you're going to say, okay, he's basically psychopathic. He doesn't have any empathy. He does what he wants for his own gain. That is the end. It doesn't matter who he's hurting. He has no concept of victims. There's no empathy, okay? And so if there's no empathy and no guilt or remorse, then basically they just do what they want to do, and then the answer is they try to get away with it. And as long as they get away with it, they win. So one of the things that you can do if there's people involved in your life, you can check the background if you can. You can look up articles. Generally speaking, psychopathic behavior hurts a lot of people. And sometimes there would be a trail of destruction that you could find. You know, broken hearts, um, uh, lying, cheating, that kind of thing. Maybe they've gotten caught but gotten away because you have to understand they are masters at lying. They will pass a lie detector test because they have no guilt. And so they can say whatever they want and there is no humanic response. They're not lying and so they're feeling guilty about it. There isn't any guilt. And this is what makes them difficult to detect and difficult to control because they lie so well. They, they believe it. It doesn't matter. It is just a process of getting what they want. And that is what we see the banks in their overall activity doing. We see whole agencies in the federal government in particular doing this. They just do it. We see the Department of Justice just taking those phone calls from the AP. Who cares about warrants? Who cares about, you know, letting people know? Who cares about rule of law? Who cares? It doesn't matter. I want to get them, so I'm going to do it. And the end justifies the means. 
There, there is no guilt or empathy associated with the means. And that's why we're going to be seeing this more and more and more. And, and you, once you've listened to this, I want you to go back and look at those articles and think about it because we need to get this strong in our brains that this is what we're facing. We're facing this kind of behavior, people and behavior, rampantly now in our government. And the one thing, the one leverage we've got is that they fear exposure. Okay, now, do you remember Jack last week? He's sharing with us that he got his um, foreclosure auction canceled. And we looked at some of the things that he had written. The bottom line is, any time, and I'm hearing this consistently, not just from Jack, but this is the point. When I'm going to, if we threaten to expose the fraud and have proof of the fraud and corruption, I think they're going to back off. That's what they did with the Aurora woman. As soon as the judge said, hey, wait a minute, I think something's wrong with foreclosure law in Colorado, you don't see the bank arguing and saying, no, 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 the law is just fine, just rule for me, I want to foreclose. You see the bank going, whoa, that one's too hot, throw that hot potato away. They just walk because they fear exposure. And truly, this is the key. They fear the exposure, and so what we need to do is continue to expose and expose and expose because the fact that Eric Holder hasn't done any of these lawsuits, we need to expose that. It's Eric's fault, basically, where we're at. He has gotten the Department of Justice completely under his control, and he's just point blank said, and probably fired any whistleblowers. There's something we could check. He's probably made rulings. I know that on my uh, Homeowner for Justice page I had some links to some other um, articles about how and memos that he distributed through the Department of Justice. We're not going to do bank fraud. We'd, we won't find that. We, we already have him on well, Lanny Bruner on um, the untouchables about I lie awake at nights worrying what would happen if I charged the banks. Uh, wait a minute. What, what what about defending the people do you not get? And of course, Lanny and Eric are partners. I mean, they're both thinking the same thing. So we need to focus on exposure. I believe exposing is the most fearful thing that they've got. If they're exposed and the rest of the country starts to seeing them for what they really are and how they really don't have any empathy, don't have any worries about following the rule of law, don't have any guilt or remorse about anything that they do that is called illegal because it broke some law. We need to expose that. So help me think of things. Let's start focusing on exposure. Exposure. Put, let's put the crisis in the correct place position that it needs to be. The fact is, the reason we have this crisis is because this Department of Justice and this Attorney General, Eric Holder, did not do their job. They did not uphold their oath of office. They did not find the fraud and corruption. And some of these articles actually talked, they were a couple years ago, actually talked about the facts that the knowingly the bank did all this forgery and fraud. So let's try to expose not just the banks, but the department that was supposed to be in charge of it. Let's give them a, the biggest black eye we possibly can. I believe that this technique of exposure is going to affect the most change we could possibly get in all levels of government. So for example, Let's expose any attorney general that isn't doing their job, like charging these uh, foreclosure entities with criminal charges. Let's expose that because that's what they're supposed to be doing. Their job is that. They are to 
to protect the people. Let's connect with their oath of office and what they're not doing. And let's hone in on that. So here's another way to hone in for public banks. Let's hone in on the fact that our public officials in the supervisor level, supervisors, need to protect the people's money. And yet by putting the money in an institution that could actually just take the money, like Wells Fargo, a lot of these, a lot of our counties have their monies in big banks like Wells Fargo's and B of A. And we already know that there's going to be a bail-in coming and they're going to take the deposits and they're going to take the people's deposits, but they're going to take our county deposits too. So let's start to expose, use that kind of a mentality of all the things our elected officials should be doing and are not. Let's expose them. Truly, I think that is a more powerful position. And as you know, I'm looking for power to the people any way we can find it. So again, let's expose the statewide grand jury, the attorney general. If there isn't one being called yet, let's start writing letters and articles to the editor and the the um, let's somebody write an article let's get it published let's let's say you know something the attorney generals in all the states are not doing their job because we have all of these foreclosure violations the, these are do the documents they're false notarizations forged signatures let's start using a a mentality of exposing them for not doing the job because we already have the proof. Rather than getting them to do the job, let's start hollering that they're not doing their job and, and bring that to light. I believe that's a stronger position. And then of course, don't forget, public banking is coming to you. Close and personal if you're in, in California, in San Rafael, it's the June 2 to 4 weekend, so that's just about three weeks away. Uh, you can sign up if you can drive in, if you can join any of these sessions, that would be fabulous. I plan to be there um, sort of doing a little live stream between the, the workshops. We'll be talking to the workshop presenters, asking questions, commentary on what is going on. So we hope to bring that to you those uh, days. And during those days when I do that, I won't be doing live stream. I can't. I'll be in the workshops. and uh, But I will be live streaming from public banking for those days. That's Sunday, Monday, two, two three, four, two, three. Yeah, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday of uh, June. So it's coming up real quick. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. I hope you take me really seriously. I hope you understand that this is this explanation is not meant to just blackball everybody and say they're all horrible. That's not the point. The point is people that have these behavior traits basically can't help themselves. They fall into these patterns. So let's you and I understand that, recognize it, know how to see it, when, you know, what it is when we see it, and then know how to defend against it. And so really the best defense is a threat of exposure. If you can threaten, if let's say there's one in your company where you work and you, you now see that. And so, you know, threatening exposure can possibly work. Listen, listen to the 30 minutes. It's really, really good stuff. And that is the heart of what we're doing for our country. We are trying to wake up America and get them to understand that what we are living in right now is tyranny. We really are. And, and that's okay, but not okay. I mean, it is what it is. Not to saying that that's what should be done, but that is normal and natural and every government falls into it automatically because the people seeking power tend to have a lot of the psychopathic traits. People at the head of the CEOs, you know, the CEOs of the large corporations, they tend to have very little empathy. They're not guilt ridden. They can't feel remorse. They're going to say, it's just business. And as they slash 7,000 employees off the payroll. And, and, and you can understand, I mean, I've been there myself. We think, well, that's probably what's needed to run the business. But, but there, 
you, you just need to listen. You need to understand that it's not necessarily all bad. Some of it gets completely out of hand. We're watching the DOJ completely out of hand. And how do we fight back and how can we put them back in the bottle? How can we, you know, put them back in the box, slam the lid down and say, and I'm sorry, that's an unconstitutional extension of your power as a federal government. The states need to rise up, but it'll only start when we start at home. We have to do this locally, so I encourage you and myself to look around at your local supervisors and city officials. Get involved in what is going on. Start to see these patterns of behavior. Start to figure out how we can actually work to shift what they do towards more power for the people. So exposing their lack of pushing for public banking, not protecting the money, uh, not charging against fraud and the criminal process. Let's start shifting how we think about how we phrase what we're doing. I think it'll be more powerful to us. And any ideas you've got, please share them with me. Because the whole point is that we want to bugger them until we get what we need. So thanks again, guys. I'm glad the live stream didn't blow up. And we'll talk tomorrow. When I was a lass, I was proud of me class. Like me father and mother before me. They taught me to fight for my civil rights. But it's always the same old story. The rich raise the bring while the poor can but drink. And the labor all liberal old Tory. And I Okay.